Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're learning about mercury in the food web with renowned isotope researcher Brian Pope. Mercury buildup in seafood is a health concern around the world, and Brian's work uses alternate forms of elements called isotopes to trace the path of mercury in the ocean food web. Good morning, Brian. It's great to be here. Um, I'm excited to learn about your work studying mercury and how it accumulates in the food web in the ocean. Excellent. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm particularly interested because I like to eat fish, <laughs> and I know that mercury accumulates, and so the fish that I like to eat might have a lot of mercury, and there's some personal relevance there, and I, I want to hear your story. It started a, a while ago, and we had just some preliminary observations just from other people's data that mercury concentrations in fish not only change as a function of where they feed within a food web, uh -huh. but also at what depth they feed. And we found that the same size fish at the same trophic position or the same position within that food web had higher concentrations of mercury. Different species have sort of preferred depth ranges that they feed in. And so when you think about ahi, there are a couple of different species that we sell as ahi. One uh -huh. of them is yellowfin tuna and the other big eye tuna. Right. Big eye tuna feed deeper in the water and they have higher mercury concentrations. Even though they eat the same sort of things that yellowfin tuna eat, nice. but they eat them in a deeper. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they seem to accumulate more mercury. Mercury has many different masses. There are seven different masses of mercury. What does it mean if mercury has different masses? Uh, they weigh different amounts. They, um, there are mercury that have low mass and high mass, and they react differently in reactions. So that means I could have the same amount of mercury in two samples and one would be heavier than the other even though they look to be the same amount. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it can be used as a, a fingerprint of where the mercury comes from. So an isotope nerd like myself and our colleagues at University of Michigan, having that many isotopes is like nirvana, <laughs> <laughs> in a nerdy way. But some of the isotopes, um, particularly the odd isotopes, can react in a slightly different fashion when they're exposed to sunlight. These so-called photochemical reactions in a, a laboratory setting when you have mercury compounds and expose them to intense sunlight. They degrade and they do so with this mercury isotope fingerprint. So what is really cool about this in terms of the ocean is that we have, we have a fingerprint for mercury that has undergone chemical reactions in sunlight. And where does that happen? Well, it's near At the, the surface. surface. We found that, yeah, those that feed near the surface have this fingerprint of photochemical degradation. And as our work evolved, it became clear that the reason why fish near the surface appear to have lower mercury concentrations is that they're feeding in an environment where the organic mercury that is taken up is degraded by sunlight. <laughs> And those that feed deep, um, it's not exposed to sunlight as much. We still see a bit of a fingerprint because mercury gets transported to uh -huh. deeper depths. Does that mean that that photo degradation actually broke the mercury down and it's no longer mercury? No, no, it just means that it, it turned it back into elemental mercury that doesn't get bioaccumulated to the same extent. I see. The form of mercury that gets uh, bioaccumulated in fish and in us is something called monomethylmercury. And the monomethylmercury 
terms of our health, it doesn't matter what the masses are. And it doesn't matter if the isotopes are distributed in a mass dependent or mass independent way. It's still methylmercury. If you are concerned with mercury in your diet, the, the fish that you should eat that have the lowest mercury are those that feed near the surface. Uh -huh. So an important finding is that we appear to have, uh, have used mercury isotopes as a fingerprint for understanding why fish that feed at the surface are, uh, are lower in mercury concentrations. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're in the School of Ocean and Earth, Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa with researcher Brian Pope talking about the role of sunlight in mercury cycling in the ocean. Most of the mercury in the ocean comes from the atmosphere. And in the surface ocean, here the surface mixed layer of the ocean. That's the part of the ocean that the, the wind blows and mixes um, on, a, on a daily basis. That mercury, that elemental mercury gets deposited and some of it, when it interacts with bacteria, it can be turned into or can be converted to an organic mercury, the so-called model methyl mercury. And that model methyl mercury can be incorporated into algae and into the kinds of grazing organisms that feed on, the, on that algae. And then they're the food for the higher trophic level organisms. But it turns out that that organic mercury can be degraded both by bacteria and by photochemical degradation up here where the sunlight is intense. We also think that some of that mercury can get attached to particles, it gets it's sticky. Uh -huh. And those particles take that elemental mercury to depth, where again, there are bacteria that can convert it to that organic form of mercury that gets incorporated through the food web. But now we see there's a, there's a slightly different food web down here, uh -huh. because these are the organisms that live at deeper depths. And so, because we don't have this photodegradation, there's bacterial degradation, but there's no photodegradation. The concentrations, we believe, of that methylmercury are higher at depth. And hence, they get incorporated into the food web. So the, the large fish that, that we would consume that are eating either the, the malolo up here or some of these bait fish down here, will accumulate higher mercury because of the mercury in their prey is higher. And this maybe has some implications as we fish out the upper layers of our ocean waters. We're now starting to find in restaurants and commercially available more of these deep water species yes. that yeah. are in this organic mercury chain at depth. Yes, exactly. What we see, and our, our data show it really quite clearly so these are the the values we see for mercury isotopic composition as a function of depth and what we have here is a measure this is more photochemical degradation and we see that the values here are so much higher than they are at depth both for different the different isotopes of mercury and that's what gave us a clue to understand that something ha was happening here at the surface that was different, that led us to hypothesize that it was photochemical degradation of mercury in the surface waters that was removing that mercury that's available to the food chain. And these data 
bear that out. The, the fish with the largest fingerprint for photochemical uh, alteration of that organic mercury is flying fish. Sure. And they live right, <laughs> right at the surface. Right. Matter of fact, some of their life is spent above the surface. <laughs> but they feed only in the upper, maybe 30 feet of the water. And then next is something like the mahi-mahi that spends also yep. a lot of its life just exactly. right at that surface. And mahi-mahi and, and tuna are, they're feeding at about the same depths. But when we get down to things like, oh, here's moonfish, uh -huh. uh, opa. Opa has a little bit more mercury, it feeds a little deeper, uh, big eye tuna as well as here's a swordfish. The swordfish is, it has typically higher mercury and it feeds at a deeper depth. So in this plot, we can think of this axis as a gauge of photochemical alteration or photochemical destruction of that organic mercury. And this axis, movement along this axis, will be other reactions like microbial formation and degradation. And we find that most of the, the data fall along this axis, and they correlate quite nicely, uh -huh. showing that photochemical alteration is the, the main process. There's a little bit of scatter in here, and that scatter is probably some of the microbial alteration that we, uh, uh -huh. we would expect but the largest signal is that photochemical degradation. The other interesting thing is that we, we measured the mercury isotopic composition of rainwater because mercury from the atmosphere is the source of mercury to the ocean. And it, they fall down here. They're not affected by this photochemistry, even though they're up in the atmosphere, there's no methyl mercury up there. It's uh, only elemental. elemental mercury. So the reactions that would cause that are, are not in play. When we ship these by the amount that we would expect for bacterial formation of methyl mercury, it's exactly transects with this line that we project down from our fish, suggesting that Mercury from the atmosphere is, again, the main source for mercury in the fish. Now, one of the implications of that is that when we look at sort of a cartoon of where mercury comes from, these are the sources of mercury here within this cartoon. And they're volcanoes. There's mercury and volcanic gases. There's anthropogenic mercury. Mercury that we put in the atmosphere for something that we want. And the major source is burning of coals. Coal has a lot of sulfur in it, and mercury likes to attach itself to sulfur. So when we combust that mercury to make energy, it releases that mercury to the atmosphere. Biomass burning does the same, and there's a constant exchange of mercury uh, with the uh, soils. There are the same kinds of microbial reactions uh -huh. that are in the that occur in the ocean, also in soils. So there's exchange there. Now, if we think about over the last uh, 50 years, 100 years, what has changed the most is well, volcanic <laughs> eruptions. Yeah, they're episodic, but they they probably haven't changed dramatically over the last 50 or 100 years. Biomass burning, maybe it's decreased a little bit. Exchange probably hasn't, hasn't changed. Exchange with the uh, soils and with, with trees and biota. The thing that's changed is the amount of burning of, of fossil fuels, in particular coal, that contains high sulfur and high mercury. Do the fish you catch now have more mercury in them than fish historically? Paradoxically, our analysis show that they don't. We don't see that, but we don't have records that go back very long. There's a few analyses of fish around Hawaii, tuna, uh -huh. that were caught in the uh, 1970s and some in the 1990s. 
And then our work was around 2008. And our analysis of that data show that there, there isn't a whole lot of change. If we look at the where fossil fuel, or in particular, the combustion of coal has, has changed, here's a plot or a bar chart that shows the um, trends in global emission of mercury. And the black is Europe, the brown is North America, the green is Asia, and the yellow other. And we can see that those emissions mainly from burning of coal uh, have decreased in Europe, and they've decreased a bit in North America, but have increased over this time range from, uh, from Asia. We're downwind of Asia, but where exactly the wind blows emissions in that mercury are not really clear. It, it may not have affected the fish around Hawaii. If it did, we're not detecting it, at least in tuna. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back. University of Hawaii professor Brian Pope shows us some of the lab equipment his team uses to understand where in the environment fish are feeding. Brian uses samples of fish tissue to trace elements like carbon and nitrogen. We prepare that sample with a bunch of chemistry and uh, a, it's a couple day procedure to form a liquid that contains the different amino acids in there. And what we'll do is we'll draw up a little bit of that liquid only like a couple of microliters of it. And we need to separate those amino acids because in this liquid, this one microliter of liquid, uh -huh. we're gonna have maybe 15 or 20 different amino acids. And we wanna measure the isotopic composition of each of those so we can use them to understand something about the, the trophic level of the organisms that we we prepare that sample from. So what we do to separate it is that we use something called a gas chromatograph. And that gas chromatograph is hooked up to Lady Gaga here. Lady Gaga only cares about the nitrogen gas that goes in, but the amino acids don't have nitrogen gas. So we have to separate those amino acids and then turn them into a gas that the mass spectrometer can measure. Uh -huh. So what we do is we take that, that sample and we inject it here. So we'll take and we'll put this in and we'll shoot in our sample. And where that goes is it, it goes into something called a gas chromatographic column. This column is 60 meters long, but it's hollow. It's like a tube. And that tube, the inside diameter, is only a third of a millimeter. It's, you can maybe fit about four or five of your hairs in there, but not many more. That kind of brownish coating is an organic film that the compounds interact with. So the amino acids are sliding through this tube and the little amino acids slide through there more rapidly than the big ones. And it gives us our way to separate those. They end up into this little tiny combustion oven. And that combustion oven is at 980 degrees. And at 980 degrees in that oven, it converts that amino acid to carbon dioxide and, and nitrogen gas, which then travels through more of that 
those tubes, but not as an amino acid, as a gas. And they go through this, our little interface here. And the interface just allows us to direct where those gases go. There are some gases that we want eventually to end up going into the mass spectrometer, but there are other things that we don't. And this is our way to divert any of the gases that we don't want in there. And how does the mass spectrometer work? Uh, the mass spectrometer takes the nitrogen gas, the molecules kind of go into what's called an ion source. And the ion source is a source of ions. The nitrogen gas gets bombarded by electrons and it knocks an electron off, so it creates a positively charged molecule. And once it's positively charged, we can make, we can, we can accelerate it out of that ion source. So this ion source makes molecules. It also, there's 10,000 volts applied to it. Oh and God. if you have a positively charged molecule that's sitting in 10,000 volts, it doesn't like to sit there. So it gets shot out. Yeah. But what this does is it, it, it creates those ions, it accelerates those ions, and it also allows us to focus those ions. And then those gases, those ions, ionized gases, go into this. This is a, a tube with a magnet around it. And what the magnet does is it affects the, those masses differently, such that it's where we separate our masses. The heavy masses, because it's curved like that, It'll go through the magnetic field and the heavy masses will be diverted, but the lighter masses will be diverted a lot more because they're lighter. Uh -huh. They then get focused into something that detects those ions and we can measure a ratio from those, a, a ratio of the nitrogen gas containing the heavy isotopes to the nitrogen gas containing the light isotopes. So the mass spectrometer creates the ions it separates them and eventually um, allows us to measure a ratio. So all of this is sort of one instrument, uh -huh. but the mass spectrometer is a little bit different, and this is kind of a preparation system. And we can put any kind of a preparation device we want onto a, a mass spectrometer. So what direction are you going to take your research next? We want to see if the mercury cycle that we've been able to interpret from the isotopic compositions of mercury uh, are similar in the equator where the production is much higher and where waters are more productive. They're also not as clear. We have clear, clean water. So we would anticipate that the photodegradation of mercury would be less in those environments. So we want to we want to learn we want to apply our model, our hypothesis to different regions. And our hypothesis would be in a productive region that has lower water clarity, we should see less degradation of uh, of mercury through photochemical degradation. And the mercury concentrations may be higher in the in the algae and in the fish that we find there. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.